Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa, and welcome to this Plunkett live chat tonight with Whanua Whena Plunkett. And tonight we're going to be talking about an issue that's been um, front of mind for a lot of whanau out there and people caring for uh, infants and tamariki. Um, we're going to be talking about managing COVID-19 in our little ones. And to talk with us about that today, we are very lucky to have the expertise of Professor Stuart Dalziel from Starship Hospital. Stuart is a um, paediatrician specialising in emergency medicine, so um, working in the ED department there. I'm Max, I'm a Plunkett, um, Plunkett nurse, I work out in the community in Puridormana and I also work at Plunkett Line. So I'm really excited about this chat tonight. Um, it's definitely a big um, topic for a lot of the whānau I'm seeing and talking to in my role, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Stuart. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Stuart. No more how do I? Kia ora. Thanks, Max. Um, as Max said, my name's Stuart Dalziel. I work um, part-time in the emergency department of Starship Hospital. So I'm one of the team of doctors and nurses who you'll see at sort of eight o'clock on a Monday morning and then also at 10 o'clock on a Friday night as well. And I also work part-time at the University of Auckland where I'm the Cure Kids Chair of Child Health Research. And so I do a lot of research both here in New Zealand and internationally in, uh, around paracetamol and ibuprofen, around respiratory conditions in young infants, and even studies on COVID-19 as well. So I've probably got a little bit of the lived experience um, of being in the emergency department at Starship over the last um, six or seven weeks. We've certainly seen um, a really big increase in the whānau um, and the tamariki who have presented to us really mm. with a range of problems. And that's both the little babies who come in and for the little babies they often tend to have fever as a predominant feature of COVID. They can also get cough like everyone can um, throughout the lifespan really right through to grandparents um, but they can also get a, an illness which is quite similar to croup as well and so mm. a real barking cough and a noise when they breathe in a <gasps> type noise when they breathe in. And so that's a concerning noise. So if you're sit hearing that at home, that's a child that you really want to get through either very quickly to your GP, to your after hours medical centre if that's close, or coming through to us from the emergency department as well. And as children get a little bit older, um, COVID probably is a little bit more um, different in that we see both the respiratory symptoms, so the cough, runny nose and fever, but we also see a, a little bit of diarrhoea, vomiting and tummy pain as well. So don't think that just because your child doesn't have a cough or doesn't have a runny nose or doesn't have a fever, that they don't have COVID because those other symptoms are relatively common in what, in what we're seeing in, in children. It seems to be a really broad spectrum of um, different symptoms um, that are hitting Fano and, and, and different Fano members as well. Um, you know, so you might have baby has the, um, the fever and the vomiting and the diarrhea but um, your teenager or your older child might have the cough, the cough or the respiratory issues. And then the parents, again, may have a, another sort of presentation of the symptoms. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. The, you know, they've all got the same virus, but we all respond mm. to it differently as well. So, mm. you know, even if you've got twins, the twins, even though they're the same age, they might respond to it differently, where, you know, one might be quite unwell and one may just have a relatively mm. mild illness from that point of view as well. So for most Tamariki, COVID is a relatively mild disease. So they're usually unwell for one or two days and then make a recovery after that. So although we've seen increased cases coming into the hospital, there's a whole lot of more cases out there. We're only seeing the tip of the iceberg um, and there's this massive base underneath 
of all the other children who are out there who've been unwell, but are unwell for just a couple of days and then bounce back pretty quickly after that. Their parents often find it worse in that they find that they're unwell for two, three weeks and feel quite tired um, even mm. after most of their symptoms have gone away. We don't see that so much in kids. Especially once those kids get their energy back and you're still a little bit... Not a hundred percent. Yeah, so I think it's really hard. Yep, it is. It is. And so, when we think about the milder presentation of COVID nineteen for our whanau watching tonight in our children and our infants out in the community, we're thinking more. What, what what sort of symptoms are we mainly looking at there for a mild presentation? What would that often look like? So, so that that may be that you've got a bit of a fever that you've got um, a sore throat or a cough, a runny nose. The children who can verbalise a little bit more may say that they have a headache as well. Um, mm. And as I said, a bit of tummy pain, diarrhoea and vomiting. And so mm. it's hard to pick which of those symptoms your child's you know, going mm. to end up with. But I think mm. the key thing is, is that they're, they're not too unwell with, with those symptoms. So, That's you know... Right. If, yeah, uh, you know, if they've got diarrhea and vomiting, we're not worried so much if they're not eating and not having meals. What we want to do is make sure that they're drinking enough. So we know that, you know, as adults, when we feel a little bit nauseous, like we're going to throw up, that we really don't want to have a big drink um, because that just kind of fills our stomach and makes us feel worse. That's the same with young infants. So mm. the trick is, is giving them small frequent sips of fluid. So for the little babies, less than one, we can give them breast milk or um, their, their bottles. Um, we can give them Pedialyte, which you can get from doctors or you can get um, over the counter um, from pharmacies. And so that's a rehydration solution. When they're a little bit older in that first year, so after six months, and if they're already taking water, if they don't want the milk, you can try them with water as well. Mm -hmm. But the thing is just giving them small, frequent sips. When the dehydrated babies come into the emergency department, what we do is we um, get the parents to have a cup of Pedialyte, which is a rehydration solution. We get them to have a syringe and we get them to feed the baby um, five mils every um, minute and over an hour they get in about 300 mils and over two or three hours so you get most of the fluid mm -hmm. that the baby needs for the day and the way to check that a baby's getting enough fluid is that I'm making enough wet nappies so as long as I'm making more than half their wet nappies then you're winning with the then you're winning with the fluids overall and for the older children it doesn't matter what fluid it is. I mean, we're not going to give them fizzy drink, but, you know, if they want water, if they want milk, mm. if they want juice, if they want ice blocks, any kind of fluid that you can get into them, soup, mm. just get that just get that fluid into them. That's really, really good tips around that, about keeping the fluids up and the um, small but frequent um, amounts of water or breast milk or formula or whatever it may be. And um, it is just to give it to them so that you're not expanding their tummy, like you said, you're not causing that nauseous, feel, nauseous feeling to come on and then they just regurgitate it all up or vomit it all up, you know, and then you get back to square one. So, yeah, that's really good. Five mils every five to ten minutes is, can be doable at home. I don't know, just, five mils. Five mils every minute. Five mils oh, every, every minute. minute. So wow. yeah, every, so five mils every minute. So you know, five mils by sixty. That's um yeah. three hundred mils. So mm. you, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, it doesn't kind yeah. of matter if you get yes. in two hundred mils in an hour or or, yeah. or three hundred mils. But mm. you just need to give it to them. You just need to give it to them regularly. Totally. Yep. Yeah. That's really cool. Another, we've had a question in um, from someone watching us tonight, and really good question. What are good tips for breastfeeding a baby with a congested nose? Because that's another big symptom of it too, isn't it? It is. And look, baby's sole job is to feed and grow, really. So they get that they get bigger, and so their biggest amount of exercise actually is feeding and 
babies breathe via their nose. So obviously when their nose gets congested, that really becomes problematic from, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. um, what we tend to do, obviously wiping the nose is um, really good in order, in order to you know, help clear things out. Um, we tend to use a syringe and put just a couple of drops of normal saline down their, mm -hmm. down their nose. And what that does is it just opens up those passages and allows them to feed. The same thing um, that you do for vomiting and kind of small frequent feeds, you can do that when they've got a congested nose as well. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, if you're breastfeeding them, put them on for a few minutes. If they're struggling, take them off, give them a chance to kind of calm mm -hmm. down because they're working a little bit harder and then put them back on again. Mm -hmm. And that is a good time to do it too, isn't it? So to try and clear that not that those nasal passages out around the time of a feed so that you know that they're going to work quite hard breathing in and out through their nose to help shift it once it's been softened, hey? Exactly, yep. And, 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 and you, it, it, work, it works really well. And if you don't have normal saline at home, can you just use some cold boiled water? some sterile sort of water. No, exactly. So if you've got a baby who's a little bit older, who's just mm. having normal bottles of water out of the tap, then you can obviously use tap water. If you've got a newborn baby who's only going to be four, you know, four weeks old, you know, the yeah. same reasons that we boil up the water to make up the milk bottles for those babies who are on milk, mm. you, you want to use boiled water. Obviously, you don't want to use hot water. You want to use cooled water. But once it's at room temperature, just use that. Yeah. And that will have the same effect, you know, mm. um, rather than the saline. That's right. So for our under four monthers, when you're still having to sterilize the bottles and the water to make formula, for instance, you're wanting to use that same um, method in terms of preparing water if you need to do a nasal flush. So that's, that's really, exactly right. really helpful yep. advice. Yeah. So look, um, when we think about Omicron in children, who do you feel is most at risk? So we kind of see a U-shaped distribution with most conditions in kids. In other words, that the little babies get hit quite hard, and then often it can, can be the older children as well, um, or the older adults. And, and we see this a little bit with Omicron as well, in terms of the really severely unwell children. So the ones that I worry about are the ones that, um, the few that actually end up going to the intensive care unit. And those children that end up going there, the risk factors for that are actually the older children. So children are older than five. And so mm -hmm. I know it's really scary when you've got a young baby and they've got COVID, but generally those children um, do better um, in terms of the really, really severe cases than the, than the older children. And we still only have relatively small numbers in either age group. Those who have got underlying chronic disease is a risk factor as well. And that's mm -hmm. really either respiratory disease or neurological disease, something which is meaning that you're seeing a pediatrician at the hospital. It's really kind of a sign that your baby's got those, those, those chronic conditions. If you're not seeing a pediatrician at the hospital, which, you know, 95% of children in New Zealand are not, then you can kind of be reassured from that point of view as well. We do worry about children who have had previous pneumonia. We know that that can be a risk factor as well. So, again, those children just need to be watched closely. Mm, okay, cool. So if we're thinking about the children who are, um, you know, you know, maybe not the ones that are most, or the, maybe the ones that are kind of most at risk, but also just our little ones out in the community who maybe have had pneumonia in the past or other chronic issues, Um what sort of presentation do we as parents need to be looking for that, hey, it might be time to go and see a doctor? Look, I think probably the first thing is tr trust yourselves as parents. I mean, you know your children better than anyone else. And if you're really worried about your child, then seek help. And, you know, although we kind of feel that the country's a little bit shut down at the moment, 
all of the healthcare system is open and um, ready for you guys to come in as well. So the things that you should look out for, obviously, if your child's deteriorating and getting worse and worse, if they're breathing a lot faster than what they usually are breathing. So a little bit of cough, well, you know, that's going to happen with COVID and that's mm. going to happen for a few days, sometimes a few weeks. That's absolutely fine. What we worry about is children that are breathing breathing fast and that's a sign that they might need more respiratory support. So mm. children who are drowsy um, and sleeping an awful lot would be worried about as well. Children who are irritable, so children where, you know, particularly little babies, if you can settle them down by holding them, then, you know, that's really good. If you can settle them down by giving them either ibuprofen, brufen, or paracetamol, PAMOL, then that's fine as well. But those children who don't settle with holding or who mm. don't settle with those two medications, that would be a sign that you need to either speak to someone or see someone as well. And we mm. were talking a little bit earlier, Max, about the fluid. So we mm. worry about children who are taking in less than half their normal amount of fluid. And that can sometimes be really difficult if you're breastfeeding mm. to kind of make mm. that guess about that. But as I said, the the kind of the outcome of drinking well is peeing well. So, you know, kids who are having half the number of wet nappies mm. as well. And if kids are in pain, would be worried about children where the pain's not settling down. And and by, by that I mean, you know, if you give them paracetamol and ibuprofen, that should make them a little bit more comfortable mm. from that point of view. And really there's a, a hierarchy of places that you can get hold of for advice. The government has a COVID health number, which you can ring, but you can ring the normal helpline number, which is mm -hmm. 0800 611 um, You can obviously go along to your GP after hours, the emergency departments mm. are open in the country. And if you're really worried about your tamariki, ring in an ambulance as well. Mm. I really like the point you made around the fact that um, as parents, you are the, um, you you know when something's up with your kid. Um, you know, you are the expert in your own child and you know what is their normal. And it's the same when you're talking about uh, breastfeeding. Although we can't necessarily see how many mils they're getting, it's about looking at what's coming out, the output, and is that gauging up as normal for them or not, you know? Um, and same with the breastfeeding itself. You know, often if you're a breastfeeding mum, you know what's normal for your baby at that point in their time. And if you notice, hey, look, it's much, much less than usual, then that's definite reason to get in. I think, um, and like you said, there is that hierarchy, you know, your GP is there, they're open and they're available when you need them. Same with um, the hospitals, you know, they're available when you need them. Um, and same with the ambulance. Calling um, Healthline for your older children and Plunkett Line for your under five. So that's um, 0800 933 922. Um, and they all do the same thing, do the triage and give you support around managing their health and um, their symptoms. And if you've just joined us tonight, um, just a quick reminder, you are um, watching the Facebook live chat um, around managing COVID-19 in, in little ones, in your tamariki and your um, infants. And we have got Professor... Stuart Dalziel from Starship's Emergency Department here talking us through it. If you haven't caught the start of this, um, when it's over, you will be able to find it posted on um, Facebook and YouTube, so you can start it from scratch then. Um, but look, we've touched on some really awesome stuff here. I guess um, another thing we can definitely go through is managing those symptoms at home with the use of PAMO and ibuprofen. So how would you kind of advise as safest to be using that with the different age groups we're talking about? So both these medications are safe in COVID. So I think that's the first thing to get across. The other thing to get across is they're both safe from babies in their first few weeks of life all the way through to um, older, older adolescents. And what we suggest that people use those medications for is not to treat the fever. So we try to not give the medication for the fever, 
but to give them medication for pain and distress. So if your child's got a fever and feeling really uncomfortable with the fever, then that's when we would give um, those medications. If they've got a fever and they're running around the house and playing with all the other kids, let them run around the house and play with all the other kids and don't give them and don't give them the medication. Mm. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to treat the pain and discomfort. Mm. And what you should do is give one of the medications first, wait an hour or so to see if it's working. And if that pain and discomfort's not working, then you could try the other medication after mm -hmm. that as well. Now, the medications, um, the dose is actually based on weight. Mm -hmm. And th there are some resources online that you can go to, to look that up. But that's somewhat quite difficult to, to, mm -hmm. to work out to, to get that right. So usually if they're prescribed by a doctor, the dose for your baby based on their weight will be written on the bottle. And, and so mm -hmm. give that. If you've got it from um, a pharmacy or if you've got it from the supermarket, then they've got doses based on your child's age written mm -hmm. on um, the boxes as well. So... The paracetamol medication, you can give that four times a day and you can give that um, four hours apart between doses. So it's only if they need it. So if you give one dose and then they're fine for the rest of the day, there's no more no more reason to give that. The mm. um, ibuprofen or brufen, you can give that every six hours, but only three doses in a 24-hour mm. period. And there's no reason to wake children in the middle of the night to give these medications if they're asleep let them sleep yeah and that's a big thing isn't it because knowing that they do need the rest their body needs to rest to be able to fight this off um and allow its own processes to manage that um virus and i guess the thing is as well as fever is um is a normal process of our immune system isn't it and in itself is um generally not harmful to baby but like no, you yeah. said about monitoring it no you're exactly right so fever is part of the body's immune system what happens when your body gets a fever it means that the virus can't actually replicate as fast as what it can at normal mm. body temperature it means that your body starts making more white cells to actually fight the virus as well and sort of mm. mount that immune response so it's part of the natural process that our body mm. does to yes. actually um, overcome the, the virus. Mm. So fever in and of itself doesn't cause any long-term damage. So it doesn't cause any brain damage. It doesn't cause anything like blindness or anything like that. And, and there's quite a bit of kind of common myths that fever in and of itself is bad, but it, it isn't. It's part of the body's natural mm. defense. So that's why I said that when we give those medications, we don't give it necessary to reduce the fever, what we do is we give it to reduce the discomfort and the pain associated with the fever. And because we're going to give it to the kid who's lethargic and miserable and not happy and has a fever, but we're not going to give it to the kid who has a fever and is running around happily playing and drinking that's, and doing all those things. That That's exactly right. And we can do other things to help them feel more comfortable with the fever as well. So, right. you know, we want Tell them to be able to yeah so so light clothes um you know taking you know down number particularly as we're moving into autumn into winter mm -hmm. and down the country it's getting colder then mm -hmm. you know taking them down so they're just in their stretch and grow using a cold flannel which will um, help them feel a little a uh, little bit more comfortable as well from from that point of view great yeah and so when we think about um you know emergency department and, and the situations that you're seeing with Omicron and COVID-19 with little ones, what are the, at what point should, um, you know, a parent really, whether it's fever, cough, cold, be um, presenting to ED with their little one? Look, I, I, I think I'd go back to my earlier point that, you know, really trust yourself. But, you know, if you're a little bit worried about your child, then actually, ringing Healthline and getting some advice over the line, ringing the Plunkett line for the under fives mm -hmm. is, a, is a really sensible thing to do or going along to your GP and see, you know, if you're worried in the morning, going along and seeing them in the afternoon. 
if you've got increased worry, then you've got to say, well, why am, why am I worried? As I said, mm. we're not particularly worried about the temperature and how high mm. it is, but we're mm. worried about babies who are breathing really fast. And it's fine for babies to breathe fast for a few minutes and then mm. settle down. Mm. It's what their breathing pattern looks like over, over a period of time. And if it looks like it's really rapid and they're struggling for their breathing, that they're sucking in here with their um, windpipe, if they're sucking in underneath their ribs, that's a sign that you need to go and see someone straight away. So either, you know, go to your after hours centre mm -hmm. or bring the baby into the emergency department as well. Those children that are really irritable, those children which are very, very drowsy and you've got difficult mm -hmm. waking them, they're the children that need, need to come and see us. And as I said, the children that are not getting enough fluid in. So, you know, that things have really wound back and they're only getting in a, um, less than half normal and they're making less than half their normal wet nappies. Wonderful. That's awesome. So, I mean, I guess another thing is, you know, what can we be doing as parents out in the community to be protecting our little ones from um, getting COVID at this time? Look, the most important thing, I think, is immunisation. And that's making sure that everyone who's eligible for immunisation has it within the household, because mm. that will stop it getting into the household. And if it gets into the household, that will mean that the older members of the household can look after the babies because they're not going to be so sick. And that actually is incredibly important when we're seeing a lot of cases out in the community. So remember, mm. for everyone who's 18 years and older, that means three doses of the vaccine. For everyone who's 5 to 17, that's two doses of the vaccine as well. And, you know, I can't reiterate that enough the most important thing is, is that we immunise our farm out today. The mm. other things we can do is, you know, just basic um, hygiene. So washing our hands, and you would have heard it at the start of the pandemic that you're meant to do it for 20 seconds, and that's meant to be singing, you know, happy birthday twice. Mm. And that's about, tw that's about um, 20, that's about 20 seconds. And soap and water is absolutely fine for that. It doesn't have to be any um, special product um, to be used. You know, mm. wearing a mask when, when you're in indoor environments and obviously mm. um, social distancing. If you're unwell, start, even a little bit unwell, staying at home, get, getting a test. And if you find that you've got COVID into your household, then there's the idea that, oh, well, once it's there, everyone in the household is, is going to get it. And I think we all thought that um, to begin mm -hmm. with because we know that Omicron's quite, quite infectious. But if we look at research overseas, and there's really good research overseas, um, if you look at the Scandinavian countries, so Norway and Denmark, their household transmission was 25%. So that wow. means if one member of um, you know, the household brought home COVID, then the chances of other members of the household getting it was only one in four. In yeah. the States, that figure was a bit like one in two, so 50%. But still, it's not inevitable that everyone is going to get COVID. Mm. And we also know that if you isolate um, the person with COVID from other members of the household, that those people who are COVID-free, their chance of getting COVID is reduced by nearly 50% if you're wow. isolating within your house. So if you can do it within your home, that is really important um, to do. And obviously, you need to look after the person who's got COVID. If it's a little baby, what um, you're going to need to do is obviously do the same cares that you usually do for them. Um, but what you can do is you can wash your hands um, before you go to see baby. You can wash your hands after you see baby as well. If, you know, the chances of little babies picking it up from a mum that's positive, um, we've got quite good data from the neonatal units, and it's probably about 10%, so about a 1 in 10 about a one in 10 chance. So the mm. things that you can do to reduce that is the hand hygiene that I was talking about, 
but also wearing a mask when you're breastfeeding or whether you're feeding as well. If you're really, really worried about not wanting to breastfeed your baby, breast milk has a lot of antibodies in it, so it's incredibly mm. important to get those through. And if you've been immunised in your pregnancy, you're going to have those antibodies to go through. There's really, really little chance of the virus going through the breast milk. What the baby does is the baby picks up the, the virus on the clothes and everything else, but not actually from inside the breast milk. So you can express the breast milk and give mm. that to baby if you don't want to don't want to breastfeed your baby. And because that's another layer of protection for our um, breastfeeding babies and toddlers is that breast milk. You know, they can't be vaccinated, but if they're getting access to breast milk, that is giving them a form of antibodies to prime their wee immune system and help them deal with it, isn't it? It is. And, and yeah. so, you know, for the vast majority of things, we really recommend that everyone continues mm -hmm. to breastfeed. And COVID is no different with, with that. There will be the odd case where, you know, the mum might be in hospital and might be really sick. Um, a lot of mm -hmm. our hospitals allowing mums to room in um, with their little babies if they're uh, um, breastfeeding. But if the mm -hmm. mum's really sick, you know, your key thing as a mum is to look after yourself as well. And, and so mm -hmm. if baby has to have bottles for a few days and that means that you get better and you're able to then look after them for the rest of their lives, that's a good thing. Yeah, big picture, eh? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. about the well-being of everybody involved um, as well. You know, baby definitely takes priority, um, but it is about the well-being of the whanau as a whole, eh? Um I guess another thing around that is, you know, like you said, like um, looking after yourself as well as parents, uh, maybe isolating, you're feeling unwell, you've potentially got it worse than your kids have and they've got over their first day of fevers and now they're bouncing off the walls and stuck inside. And, you know, you're still under the symptoms of COVID-19. So I guess, you know, now's a really good opportunity just to, um, you know, point out that in times like that, you know, priorities are priorities and anything other than that you just got to let it go um and look after yourself you know stay um stay just yeah just stay sane you know so just you know making sure the kids are safe and fed and um you know the basics are met um but really if they you know if mum needs to lie on the couch for a while and you're just reading books all day then that's fine if the vacuuming and whatever the dishes haven't necessarily been done then that's fine you know um yeah I mean because that's the reality that parents are having to having to deal with during this as well yep yeah cool so look this has been an amazing um chat and um, we've had um some really good questions through we've got one more here that I reckon we'll we'll just try and answer before we okay, um, yeah. end for the night so um a question from someone watching hi there I have an 11 day old baby and have tested positive for COVID on Monday is there anything I can do to protect my baby from getting COVID and that's really good we just touched on some of those things eh so maybe we'll just go through a bit of a recap if you don't mind Stuart yeah look uh, yeah no that's fine look I'm really sorry you've got COVID and, and a little baby you know that's that's really hard and it's and it's really it's really it's really stressful as well so um uh, the things that you can do is um, if you're breastfeeding, as I said, the risk of getting COVID if, you, if you've if you got it and you've got an 11-day-old old baby is about 10%. The vast majority of those babies actually don't get too sick with their with their with their COVID as well. There there are there are a number who, who do and, and end up and end up in hospital, but generally they don't get um, too unwell be, because of that. In order to avoid transmitting the virus to your baby, obviously we talked about isolation before and how important um, that is. And if there's you know another family member in your far now who can look after that baby um, outside of feeding and things like that, then let them look after look mm. after the baby so that you can look after yourself. If you're still breastfeeding the baby, um, and as I said, breastfeeding is really good because you've got natural antibodies that um, go from your breast milk um, to the baby. The virus itself doesn't go from your breast milk 
to the baby. What comes across is, is the protection. So continuing to breastfeed is a good thing, but obviously that increases the risk because you're going to be close to the baby. So the key thing to do is to wash your hands beforehand, um, and that's for 20 seconds, soak in water, singing happy birthday twice, um, washing your hands afterwards as well, wearing a mask and wearing one of the blue surgical masks. I wouldn't wear a cloth mask, I'd wear a blue surgical mask because we know that you know there are degrees of masks in terms of which mm. ones are good. And this is one where you, you want to mm. get the good mask for, um, from this point of view. So wearing a surgical mask, and I would do that any time you're within two metres of the baby so if you're outside of that that kind of that magic two meter thing then you wouldn't need to wear your mask um, in order to protect the baby but if you were within two meters of the baby I'd, I'd wear the mask then I guess we'll just um, make one sort of um, request for you to touch on something just briefly. I know I've had a lot of families um, asking, you know, what are the impacts on the child's experience socially with mask use and on their development? And um, I understand where, you know, parents are coming from, you know, with the increased, um, you know, masks that kids are coming into contact with. But in the long term, we're not looking at any um, detrimental effects because it is used short term, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's going to be a short term thing. So, you know, we know from overseas stuff that babies are still smiling at the, you know, at the same time um, that, that, that they usually do, you know, before that six week mark. And so, you know, and the ch children are really, really resilient. And so, you know, we think it's abnormal because we've had, you know, many, many years where we haven't been wearing a mask. Mm. They don't know any, they don't know anything different yeah. from, from, from that point of view. So from the little babies in terms of bonding with your baby and things mm. like that, and for the toddlers, there's really no concern uh, ab about mask use. For them, it just becomes a normal part of their routine. You know, mm. if you kind of look overseas at, you know, some two and a half year olds and things like that, they're quite used to it, to wearing to wearing a mask. You know, overseas uh, from a number of other countries, they know that four and five year olds can be quite comfortable mm. in school putting their mask on and wearing it um, while that while while they're in the school. So kids are incredibly resilient. What we want is we want our kids to enjoy their normal activities. And so that means, you know, going to school if they're well and if their classmates are well, because that's really important for their for their for their education. Mm -hmm. Playing with other children like, like like they usually like they usually do as well. And I think the other thing to reiterate from a health point of view is that we undertake our usual health activities. So, mm -hmm. you know, just because we've got COVID out here doesn't mean that all the other things that we immunise for are any less important. In fact, they potentially become more important because we potentially may see fewer children immunised because parents are reluctant to take them along because they think their child might pick up COVID either where they're getting their vaccine from. Mm. And it's really, really important that we deliver our usual childhood immunisations. Mm. So at six weeks, at three months, um, at five months and mm. onwards at the usual time. So if your children are due their vaccines, the GPs all have a really, really good pr process now where they put the respiratory patients to one side and they put the clean patients who don't have COVID to the other side and you can take your um, tamariki in and they yeah. can get their vaccines. And that's a really important thing to do. Yeah. They're still a priority, aren't they? Those, those they are indeed. Yep. scheduled um, childhood immunisations. Look, this has been fantastic, Stuart. It's been wonderful picking your brain on this topic and getting all your wealth of knowledge um, and these messages out to our whanau in the community and our caregivers who are, you know, dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment. And what a crazy time it's been. Um, so are there any other sort of um, last words you wanted to kind of put out there? No, I, I think, as I said, look after yourselves. And if you're worried, seek medical help.
Awesome, cool. So just a summary of the points we've been over tonight. So for most children, COVID-19 is a relatively mild disease. Um, you know, just seeking support when you, when you are worried and you know your child is not their normal self. And if you're concerned, then get along and trust that instinct and get them assessed. Breathing concerns, level of alertness, very drowsy, hard to wake up, things like that. Get them in immediately. Um, if they're dehydrated, um, much less input in terms of fluid and much less output in terms of urine, then again, we're getting them assessed by a doctor. Um, and worry about the children that are breathing faster. Yeah, that's a really, really important point. Faster um, for prolonged periods. Um, and I guess the thing is, you know, um, if they're really still in a lot of pain, really miserable, um, after they've had a dose of paracetamol or ibuprofen, that's another sign that, look, maybe that's not doing its job and maybe it's a little bit more than that and they need to be assessed. Um, both paracetamol and ibuprofen are safe medications to use to treat for pain and discomfort and distress, but we don't need to be treating the fever itself. If your child has a fever, but they're running around, they've got energy, they're drinking, they're happy, they're engaging, then we don't need to give them a dose of that at that point. And if they come right after their first dose, then we don't need to give more doses. Um, so just, you know, if you're ever unsure, call us at Plunkett Line, 0800 933 922. There's a registered Plunkett nurse on the end of that phone 24 seven, and they can give you as much advice you need and they can do an assessment over the phone as well. But, and um, also another really key point that we've made, breastfeeding is safe while you're COVID-19 positive and it's actually good for baby and protects them further. So just keep that up. If it means that you need to wear a mask, wash your hands regularly, keep distance from baby when you're not feeding, then that's awesome, um, but it's still worth doing. Um, and yeah, look after yourselves. That's the other main point from this tonight. So look, just want to put it out there to the whanau at this time. It's been a rough couple of months, um, but we're getting through it. And as a community and as a nation, we do seem to be really doing awesome at supporting each other. Remember the health services that are available to, here to us in Aotearoa are still available. The systems are still working. If you need a GP, if you need emergency department, they are still there. Sometimes it may look a bit different, like with Plunkett, we may be doing virtual checks. Um, we may, there has been a bit of rescheduling and stuff like that recently. And I just want to put it out there as well. A massive thank you to the whanau out there who engage with us and have been so flexible and patient during this time as well as the um, health system and as in general has been quite stretched. But like I said, we're getting through. Look, thank you so much, Stuart Dalziel. It was wonderful talking to you. No, that's absolutely fine. I enjoyed it, Max. It was great. Cool. All right. Well, look, take care, everybody. Ka kite, And take care and look after yourselves. And remember to get in touch if you need anything with Plunkett Line. Ka kite. <laughs>